On this Thursday night, the Canadian Armed Forces in crisis. It really has been a big shock for everyone in uniform. The dual investigations into Canada's new top soldier and his predecessor. Plus, multiplying allegations about sexual misconduct in the military. You're bending over to untie your boot and then someone grabs your butt. Broken promises how Ottawa is failing to investigate international human rights abuse complaints linked to Canadian companies. And utterly dissatisfied. The texture has changed. The cold, hard facts about our butter and why dairy farmers are not laughing. We have nothing to hide. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There is intense turmoil at the highest ranks of the Canadian military tonight after Global News broke the story about allegations of sexual misconduct against the former chief of the defense staff. The man appointed to replace him has also stepped aside and he is also under investigation. General Jonathan Vance stepped down in January as chief of the defense staff after announcing his retirement last year. Admiral Art McDonald took over and now just six weeks later He's also stepped aside pending an investigation. The reason has not been made public. The CBC is reporting McDonald is also being investigated for suspected sexual misconduct. We have complete coverage tonight from Mercedes Stevenson and David Aiken in our Ottawa Bureau. David, let's begin with you. Well, Donna, we start with a middle-of-the-night bombshell involving Canada's highest-ranking military officer, and that has plunged the Canadian forces into a crisis. Uncharted territory uh, and a real body blow to the Department of National Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces. I mean, these are, this is uh, really, I think, a crisis uh, for our military. It was well known that this type of misconduct was happening uh, within the ranks from running from bottom to top. Admiral Art McDonald's decision to voluntarily step aside was announced in a statement published by the military after 11 p.m. Eastern Wednesday. No official explanation for McDonald's decision was provided, but in the House of Commons Thursday, the Deputy Prime Minister had this to say. Every woman in Canada should be able to do her job free of harassment. The Canadian Forces National Investigation Service has confirmed an investigation into Admiral McDonald. McDonald, who has made no comment on the matter, is a decorated naval officer who had only been chief of the defense staff for two months, replacing General Jonathan Vance, who served nearly 40 years in the Canadian Army. Vance is under investigation for allegations of inappropriate sexual conduct towards two female subordinates. Vance denies the allegations. What's disappointing is when the chain of command is either part of the problem or the chain of command doesn't have the opportunity to do the right thing because they don't know about the, the issues themselves. People need to re realize that it's bigger than just the issue of sexual misconduct. It's an issue of um, shifting culture. It's an issue of power imbalance. Um, and it's a, we need to take a wider lens if we really want to make any change that's, in, that's going to make any difference. In the meantime, Lieutenant General Wayne Eyre will become the acting chief of the defense staff. Eyre is a Saskatchewan native who joined the military in 1988, and he will not be unfamiliar to the chain of command in this country and among our allies. You know, you really just can't understate or underplay uh, how disruptive something like this is for our defense relations with the rest of the world and in the defense of Canada. Now, as for any further allegations, the government today insisting all allegations will be independently investigated regardless of the rank of the individual involved. Donna? All right, David Aiken, thanks. When two of the top leaders in the military are under investigation, what does that say about the organization itself? Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson broke the story about the allegations against General Vance. Mercedes, you have lots of contacts within the military. What are you hearing tonight? Donna, literally getting dozens and dozens of emails a day about this, but in particular, the last 24 hours have stunned and shocked people, even people who believed and had said that they thought that sexual misconduct uh, was potentially endemic at senior levels of the Canadian forces. Still stunned to see a second chief of the defense staff uh, now under investigation by the CFNIS, the military police. A lot of people describing this to me as feeling like a reckoning in the 
Canadian forces as a moment when they will finally confront what Operation Honor was supposed to have achieved six years ago. But many, many women have told me that they don't feel that way. And, and to give you a sense of some of what I'm hearing, I'm getting emails saying the truth matters. I, too, am a survivor of military sexual assault. Finally. Uh, at the time, I wondered what I had done uh, from one man who was kicked out of the Canadian forces who says, I was forced out for less. Uh, so you're really hearing people saying they feel that this is a moment when the Canadian forces has to confront this problem that they believe was happening with commanding officers and at the senior ranks. We spoke to one woman who is a survivor of military sexual trauma. She told us what her experience was like. A guy here, a guy there. Um... You know, you don't do something one guy wants, and then all of a sudden you become a target. You're really um, unsure of what to do. You don't know who you can and can't talk to, so you kind of just put up with it for a long time. It's demoralizing. It scares you. And the main thing we're hearing, Donna, is really that people have taken courage from what Major Kelly Brennan said to Global News and her willingness to speak out and put her name and face on it. Mercedes, this is such a shakeup at the most senior level. What happens now? How does the military fix this? Well, essentially, a lot of folks are saying cultural change, that it can't just be talking the talk, it has to be walking the walk. And that means those top officers can't be saying one thing and doing another. And on top of that, they are looking at everyone. I, this has been described to me as a dragnet, that they are going to go through and try to find out who there's allegations against and pursue those in a way that has not been done before. Donna? All right, Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thank you. Sexual misconduct in the military is not limited to Canada. In the U.S., a female member of the U.S. Marine Corps has posted a raw and distressing video on TikTok. She describes how she felt when she found out the Marine found guilty of mistreating her was allowed to remain in uniform. Able to admit what he did, and they say, okay, well, you were really good at your job, and yeah, you did a bad thing, but we're going we're gonna to make sure that you get out honorably. She says her name is Delina and that she reported a co-worker for sexual misconduct in 2019. In December 2020, she says she was told her alleged attacker would be honorably discharged. Last week, she learned he is staying put. This is exactly why females in the military kill themselves. The Marine Corps responded with a statement confirming the man was found guilty and that the final actions in the administrative separation process are ongoing. It says it takes any allegations seriously and provides the required assistance to any and all victims. It is worth noting the man found guilty in that case also served as a victim advocate tasked with supporting sexual assault survivors. In other news, it is an important day in Alberta. The premier says the province has been sideswiped by what he calls a triple black swan of the global recession, the collapse in energy prices and the pandemic. Not long ago, Alberta's finance minister tabled his latest budget. The province forecasts an $18.2 billion deficit. The government is setting aside $1.25 billion in additional money for a COVID-19 contingency fund and is increasing health care spending by $900 million. It also plans to invest another $1.7 billion in funding to build infrastructure and create jobs. Heather Urex West breaks down what this all means for Albertans. A briefing on budget 2020. A year after uh, tabling a budget that became uh, irrelevant almost as soon as it passed, Alberta has laid out what it hopes is a path towards recovery. Budget 2021 was developed in response to our challenges. It's a plan that will see Alberta past its current crisis by focusing on what matters most. But it's a daunting road forward. Alberta's deficit, which ballooned from 7 to more than $20 billion last year, is budgeted at more than $18 billion for the year ahead. The province says balancing the budget will have to wait. Resource revenue remains soft, there are no new taxes, and the province has increased spending, promising more money for capital economic stimulus projects and the pandemic response. There is also new investment in economic diversification. It funds specific sector strategies such as technology, tourism, aviation, aerospace and pharmaceuticals, energy, financial technology and agriculture. The challenge of this budget is, is to try to generate confidence, not so much in Jason Kenney's leadership or even the government, but on 
uh, in the proposals. The popularity of Alberta's premier has fallen sharply in the last 12 months. On top of challenges associated with a drop in the global demand for energy, the government has come under fire for its handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, a travel scandal, while having to reverse course on several unpopular policies. The government has been in a tailspin throughout much of 2021. Budgets aren't a way out of it. Budgets can make that worse. This year's deficit does not yet account for the more than $1.2 billion in losses associated with the government's investment in the now cancelled Keystone XL pipeline. The province says it will focus on reducing the deficit over the next two years with spending cuts. But beyond that, new sources of revenue, like taxes, will likely be needed to get to balance in the years ahead. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. There's some optimism in Ontario that public health restrictions and vaccines are having an impact on reducing the spread of COVID-19. Though officials continue to warn the new variants of concern could reverse progress if people let their guard down. The latest modeling reveals the recent decline in the seven-day average of new cases has leveled off and may be ticking back up. In the likely scenario, variants will cause daily case numbers, the yellow line in this graph, to increase to around 2,000 per day by the end of next month. And in the worst case scenario in the modeling, seen on this graph in purple, nearly 4,000 new cases every day. The military commander leading Canada's vaccine distribution is confident deliveries are now back on track. The federal government says 1.3 million doses of the Moderna vaccine will be shipped in March, and more than 3.7 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine will be sent by April 15th. This next month alone, we will receive over 3 million doses um, of the 6 million doses of both approved vaccines. And in terms of those two approved vaccines alone, 23 million in the, in the April to June time frame. That's Major General Danny Fortin. He says provincial, territorial and federal governments are planning a virtual exercise on March 9th to go over how to handle the increased vaccine deliveries. And there is an update tonight on the numbers. Canada's public health agency says one and a half million doses have been administered so far. That means about 2.9 percent of Canadians have received one dose while just over 1% have received two doses. My goal was to get 100 million COVID vaccine shots in people's arms in my first 100 days as president. And today, I'm here to report we're halfway there. 50 million shots in just 37 days since I've become president. That is American President Joe Biden marking a vaccine milestone in that country. He says the goal is to have enough doses for every adult American by the end of July. Cautious optimism after a year of enduring the pandemic. Coming up, how more countries are starting to crush the curve. This is quite the serenade. From their balconies, Fiji's rugby team sang a beautiful thank you song to hotel staff and security after spending two weeks in quarantine in Sydney, Australia. Quarantine is mandatory for all international arrivals there. There's cautious optimism the worst of the pandemic could be behind us. Vaccine distribution is increasing, though there are still more than 100 countries who have not administered a single dose. Today, Pfizer announced it is doing a small clinical trial of a third shot, a booster, to determine if it protects against the more contagious variants. Those variants remain a wild card. But as Eric Sorensen reports, overall, there are signs of hope. For many countries, to look at Israel is to see the future, a hopeful future. Most Israelis have now been vaccinated. Not only has shopping opened up, the country is allowing activities like live theater for those immunized. There's almost a giddiness around ordinary activities. The life coming back. <laughs> what can I say? Worldwide, there is reason for optimism. Per capita globally, COVID-19 case numbers peaked in January and have fallen by about half in just the last six weeks. In Canada, a similar trajectory over the last year. The U.S., the U.K. and Israel saw their worst numbers of the pandemic six weeks ago and are now seeing a very steep drop off. And in those three countries, vaccines may be making a difference. Studies in the U.K. and Israel show a drop in infections and hospitalizations after immunizations. In the groups that have been vaccinated, 
their cases are dropping much quicker than if they haven't been vaccinated. So clearly, on a small scale, in most places, vaccine is having a role. Vaccines add to many factors, gradually forcing the pandemic into submission, including lockdowns and individual habits like distancing and masks. Drugs and other treatments have reduced the severity. And population immunity, those who've had the virus and increasingly those who've been vaccinated. So we know that we're going to have sufficient vaccine by the middle of this year. So we're going to be done with this to a large extent by the end of the year. But what about the new COVID variants? They are bound to create a surge in cases in the weeks ahead, in this country and others. But experts believe vaccines will still make a big difference. Even with variants, we've seen that all of the vaccines are very good at decreasing severe illness and death. That is a huge win on a public health level and is still one of our tickets out of the pandemic. The UK is also a leader in administering vaccines and starting next month, restrictions will be lifted in stages. A wretched year will give way to a spring and a summer that will be very different and incomparably better. The aim for full lockdowns to become a thing of the past. I can't wait to be able to go out and have a bit of normality, be lovely. And as more nations get vaccinated, what may spread now is optimism. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Canadian companies accused of human rights abuses overseas still ahead. Are they being let off the hook? Rescue efforts are underway in Indonesia at this illegal gold mine. Days of heavy rain triggered a landslide, trapping dozens of workers. More than a dozen have been rescued. At least six are dead and several others are still missing. Illegal mining operations are common in Indonesia. The federal government in Canada is scaling back one of its human rights commitments. The Liberals promised to create a watchdog to investigate allegations linked to Canadian companies operating overseas. The office will soon be open, but as Jasmine Pisano explains, it won't have all the powers needed to properly look into complaints, including some serious allegations being fired at one Canadian mining company. It's a feeling of loss that passes every year. Claudiana Dos Santos says she lives close to where Canadian company Yamana mines for gold in the Brazilian city of Jacobina. She claims that the dust from the mining is making people sick. The most common occurrences were these, sinusitis, asthma, shortness of breath. Foreign plaintiffs have filed eight related court claims in Canada against Canadian extractive companies. None of those cases involve Yamana. But some find it difficult and expensive to pursue justice through Canadian courts. People who are impacted find that they have nowhere to go to seek help. A real change! In 2015, the Trudeau Liberals promised to create a watchdog, later called the CORE, to advise Canadian companies and investigate complaints when needed. The Liberal government later paid an expert who suggested the best way to ensure the CORE has the necessary powers would be to create a law but after years of industry lobbying, the government scaled back its plans for the core. My office does not have the ability to enforce um, any of our recommendations. In 2018, the government said online that the core would be able to compel witnesses and documents. But today, it says she can review allegations and provide advice to the government. Having the ability to compel testimony and documents would you know, put us in, a, in a, um, the most favorable um, situation to be able to assess um, the facts and to be able to come to recommendations. The Office of the International Trade Minister, Mary Ng, said in a statement, not collaborating in good faith with the Corps can result in the withdrawal of trade advocacy support and the refusal of future support from Export Development Canada. Canada should not be relying only on voluntary responses. Yamana told Global News allegations in Jacobina were unsubstantiated and that there's no detrimental impact from this mine's operations. Its human rights policy says Yamana is committed to protecting the health and safety of all individuals affected by its business activities. But Dos Santos says the mining has transformed her community and she's afraid generations to come will never have the same memories that she did. Jasmine Pisano, Global News, Toronto. Next, I can't believe it's not softer, the big butter debate.
Let's listen to what they're dealing with in Canada. Some Canadians say they've noticed butter is harder than it was in the past. When you're stuck at home for almost a year, these are the things you start to notice. Like, uh, honey, does, does the mustard seem more mustardy? <laughs> Laughter about Canadian butter is spreading as fast as a bad pun, but there is a serious question about what's going on and why palm oil is ending up in a product that comes from cows. Ross Lord reports. Now this butter's been out for 24 hours. And it still makes for tough spreading. This Nova Scotia food researcher says it's because Canadian butter has become thicker. There are so many people noticing the same thing at the same time. Sylvain Charlebois suspects people are noticing the difference because they're using more butter in the pandemic baking boom. He blames the chunkiness on this, palm oil and its extracts used in dairy cattle feed. Palm oil gets a bad name because cultivating it destroys rainforests. The question I think is, is whether or not it is ethically questionable given the baggage that comes with palm oil. The controversy with the hashtag Buttergate has caused people to take sides online. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency says milk produced from a cow that's fed palm oil is safe, suggesting it's not much different than vegetable oil. But the dairy industry is backing off. The Dairy Farmers of Canada says after listening to concerns expressed by consumers, it's asking farmers to consider alternatives to palm supplements while a working group studies the issue. We want to understand the science, but at the same time, we also want to, uh, you know, exceed the expectations of our consumers in Canada. Some farmers are reluctant. When uh, somebody attacks the industry and how we feed our cows to say that we're, we're hiding something is just, uh, you know, wrong. We have, we have nothing to hide. This Nova Scotia farm says it includes just a tiny fraction of a palm oil derivative in its feed rations because it's rich in calories, which make for more productive cattle. My only ask is if we have to uh, stop using this product, which I'm totally willing to do, then the stuff, the 20% that we import, darn well better be held to the same standard. Charlebois says he's received threats from dairy farmers over his comments. An issue that seemed innocuous has turned out to be no laughing matter. Ross Lord, Global News. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Year Canada is the sunrise over Northern Bay, Newfoundland and Labrador. Thanks for watching. Robin Gill will be here tomorrow, and I'm back on Saturday with a new reality. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.